the first presentations will be from Dr. Tanova, which is our leading anesthesiologist in uh, St. Ivan Risky Hospital. She's going to speak about the treatment after uh, and taking care after the treatment for the patient, and mainly the, this so fatal sometimes uh, vasospasm we have. Thank you. Well, I will present you the uh, intensivist point of view regarding the multidisciplinary approach in treatment of post hemorrhage vasospasm in the aneurysm, uh, patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, without going deep into numbers, uh, I will just mention, as it was previously mentioned, that uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is still a devastating event with a high mortality. And uh, uh, although the survival um, has increased in the last decades, um, uh, there is still a significant long-term disability and neurocognitive impairment uh, among survivors, survivors, and one of the most important causes of mortality and poor uh, neurological outcome is namely the cerebral vasospasm and the delayed cerebral ischemia. Uh, there is evidence that treatment of these patients in high volume, uh, specialized centers with dedicated teams of neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and neurointensivists improves the results, and vice versa, um, uh, the too big decentralization, uh, which is uh, a trend in the United States, for example, may, on the other hand, be associated with worse outcomes. So. Um, that's why the multidisciplinary approach in a specialized center is really something that matters. Uh, the subrognoid hemorrhage develops in two phases, the early phases within the first 72 hours after the onset with the um, transient global ischemia and the sympathetic hyperactivity, and from 72 hours onwards uh, comes the delayed phase where this delayed cerebral ischemia appears. Uh, the um, tasks of the neurointensivists include early management after subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, with the initial resuscitation of the patient before the coiling or clipping of the aneurysm, then the management of delayed cerebral ischemia, and of course the management of all the systemic complications which are related to subarachnoid hemorrhage. The focus of this presentation is mainly the management of delayed cerebral ischemia, which in the time course of the events after a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, appears somewhere between the fourth and fourteenth day. Uh, the period can be extended up to the twenty-first day. Uh, but in some small part of the patients, about four to five percent, there could be an ultra early angiographic vasospasm, which is um, an arterial narrowing within the first 48 hours of, after subarachnoid hemorrhage. The exact mechanisms are still not very clear. Maybe it's because of direct manipulation of cerebral vasculature during surgery or angiography or mechanical pressure on vessels surrounding intracerebral subarachnoid hematoma. Anyway, uh, although it is um, quite rare, it actually leads to a twofold increase in the risk of um, delayed cerebral ischemia and cerebral infarctions. And the patients with ultra-early vasospasm should be monitored very vigilantly for signs of DCI early in their course. And unfortunately, they're uh, refractory, usually refractory to treatment of vasospasm. Uh, as for the uh, delayed cerebral ischemia, which is the much more common event, um, after the fourth day, uh, according to the definition, it's any new focal neurological deficit or a decrease of at least two points on the Glasgow Coma Scale, and the symptoms should last at least one hour, shouldn't be a present uh, uh, immediately after aneurysm repair, and other causes should be excluded, such as hydrocephalus, fever, uh, electrolyte disturbances, seizures, especially the non-convulsive seizures. Um, and also, delayed cerebral ischemia is an appearance of new infarctions on CT or um, MRI. Uh, but the large vessel vasospasm actually is just one of the factors um, in the genesis of the delayed cerebral ischemia. There are many more factors uh, which are implied. This, these are the neuroinflammation, the microthrombosis, the microvascular dysfunction, 
uh, and also um, an altered cerebral acti um, electrical activity with the cortical spreading depolarization. So this multifactorial uh, genesis is confirmed by the fact that angiographic vasospasm does not always relate to DCI. It occurs in 40 to 60 percent after subarachnoid hemorrhage, but leads to DCI in only 20 to 30 percent. And the successful treatment of angiographic vasospasm does not necessarily reduce uh, all-cause mortality of DCI. It's also important that some patients with DCI have no angiographic vasospasm, so uh, that's why uh, the um, it's, um, it can confirms that mechanisms independent of large vessel vasospasm cause secondary ischemic brain injury. Um, uh, for um, detection of early detection of uh, delayed cerebral ischemia, we have to monitor the patients. In the awake patients, uh, this means frequent neurological examination. When the patients are sedated, this is not possible, of course. And here comes uh, uh, to help the daily transcranial Doppler ultrasound, but we have to bear in mind that the data are best for the middle cerebral artery. There is the best sensitivity and specificity. And the gold standard is the conventional cerebral angiography, of course. There are other non-invasive um, tools which can help us in um, detecting a vasospasm, CT angiography, perfusion CT, MRI and MR uh, angiography. The perfusion CT is a promising too. Uh, uh, in some centers, not in ours, I must confess, but supplementary monitoring is um, implemented. Uh, the partial brain tissue oxygenation monitoring, the microdialysis uh, for estimating the brain metabolism and quantitative EEG. These tools are good for evaluation, better evaluation in poor grade uh, patients. Um, the only two measures that have uh, a proven effect on the prevention of delayed cerebral ischemia are nemodipine and uh, maintenance of euvolemia. Uh, the nemodipine, it's interesting that it has no effect actually in the angiographic vasospasm, but still it improves our outcome and it should be taken from the patients. Um, it's better the oral uh, nemodipine for 25, uh, 21 days. And um, uh, as for the euvolemia, the um, um, Classical Triple H therapy has become uh, now old-fashioned uh, because um, from the triple, uh, uh, three H's only the hypertension is left now in the protocols. Actually, the prophylactic hypervolemia is not useful. It can even be dangerous because of fluid overload and uh, a potential for pulmonary edema. Also, hypovolemia should be uh, avoided in those patients and a strict input-output balance should be uh, kept. Um, uh, uh, numerous pharmacological interventions have been evaluated for uh, DCI prevention and uh, a lot of other um, uh, um, trials um, are ongoing. Um, they are coping with the different aspects of the delayed cerebral ischemia, not only the vasospasm, but still none of them has shown any uh, beneficial result. Um, so the goal of the prevention of vasospasm still remains uh, elusive. Uh, when we detect uh, a de delayed cerebral ischemia, according to the definition that I have um, mentioned earlier, we have to promptly treat those patients, and we uh, treat them in a stepwise manner. Um, the first-line therapy, it's, um, it's in the domain of the intensivists. It's induced hypertension and volume optimization. Um, with an initial elevation of mean and arterial pressure by 25-30%, but it should be not more than 150 millimeters mercury. We use usually norepinephrine or phenylephrine. And um, then we um, do a volume optimization with boluses of isotonic fluids or more rarely colloids or hypertonic saline. Then uh, come two tires of rescue therapy. Uh, the first tire of rescue uh, therapy includes the endovascular uh, therapy. 
uh, with an intraarterial vasodilators, usually verapamil or nimodipine, balloon angioplasty stent implantation. Uh, another um, part of the rescue therapy in the TAR1 is the cardiac output augmentation and uh, hemoglobin optimization, which should be maintained above 80 grams per liter. And uh, a second tier of the rescue therapy includes therapeutic hypothermia intrathecal vasodilators or thrombolytics, uh, block of the stellate ganglion, and uh, eventually intraortic balloon pump. Of course, each institution, there are no strict protocols, no strong recommendations, and each institution decides at which stage to uh, implement the different um, um, interventions, the different measures. What we do at our institution, uh, this is the induced hypertension and volume optimization, and if this doesn't work, we do um, uh, um, conventional angiography with an uh, application of intraarterial vasodilators. Uh, balloon angioplasty, our colleagues, the neuroradiologists, uh, do only when there is a detection of periprocedural uh, vasospasm, but not as a routine practice in the late, uh, um, in the delayed cerebral ischemia. And I will just show two brief cases. The first one is a female patient, uh, 40 years of age, and has two fissure four. Um, her aneurysm was caught on the second day after subrachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, she developed a late vasospasm on day 12. She had uh, left hemiparesis and facial asymmetry. Uh, on the MRI, which I'm sorry, but I mm, haven't shown this, but there were a signs of subacute ischemic changes in the right hemisphere. On the same day, intraarterial application of nimodipine uh, was performed uh, with no um, very obvious result. Uh, on the next day, day 13, a second intraarterial nimodipine application was done again, and there was a resolution of symptoms, and the patient was discharged with no neurological impairment on uh, day 23. Here, is the, here are the images before and after the nimodipine application when the results are the angiographic results are evident and they correlate well with the clinical results. And one more case, it was a very recent case, a male patient of uh, 45 years of age, uh, Hunton has four Fisher four. He, became, uh, he came to our institution already intubated and sedated from another hospital. On the third day after subrachnoid hemorrhage, uh, his aneurysm was coiled, and um, right afterwards, because of an acute hydrocephalus, an um, external ventricular drainage was put. On the day six, he was extubated, but in the following days, uh, there was a progressive deterioration of the patient's condition with decreased level of consciousness and left hemiparesis, and or the ninth day, an intraarterial application of the Rapamil was uh, performed. Actually, the, the results, neither the angiographic nor the clinical results were very um, um, uh, good. Here I will show just uh, uh, the images before and after the Rapamil applications. The difference is not very evident here. But, um, and the patient, afterwards, the patient had a very long and very complicated recovery period with a lot of complications, uh, uh, multiple fever episodes, um, epileptic seizures, uh, uh, hydrocephalus because of the chronic hydrocephalus, uh, uh, ventricular peritoneal anastomosis was implanted on the 58th day of his hospitalization. And uh, afterwards, on the almost three um, months, he was at our hospital, but he was discharged uh, with some cognitive impairment and with no motor uh, deficit. So although this is not uh, the most representative case, I decided to show it because I would like to emphasize that the pathophysiology of subarachnoid hemorrhage is quite complex. The delayed cerebral ischemia is a multifactorial uh, process. The vasospasm is an important factor, but 
uh, it's not only the, va the vasospasm that matters, and even the poor great patients, as was the example that I showed you, deserve their chance. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tanova. Is there any questions from the audience? Okay. I have a brief question. Why do you yes. do uh, stellatum blockade so late? It's, I think it's easy. Yes, uh, it's easy, easy, very it's easy, easy measure. That's and it gives, right. It, it gives you a few hours of. As I said, there is no. I put it in the third um, uh, tire, but actually it could be done really very early. And we are. I must confess that we are not performing it, but we have discussed with the neurosurgeons, and we are planning to perform it even in an earlier. Um, um, stage, so I totally agree that it could be done. It's easy and it has, it can have good results. As a last resort, um, we have sometimes done continuous infusions of intra-arterial nemodipine, leaving the catheters inside. For how long? And um, for actually up to eight days, but uh, sometimes we have to change them, um, basically until the vasospasm phase is over. Sometimes you need several catheters. Um, not recommending this as the treatment of choice, but um, the um, uh, uh, nemodipine does not uh, so the, the half uh, the life is so short um, that that sometimes and it's been successful. So I think we've done six or seven cases and it has worked. You have to look for infection, of course. There are risks when you have to change the infusion that no air comes in. Yes, um, but is there also some effect of the blood pressure? How you continuously yes, yes the blood raise pressure. It? Uh, well, it, uh, there is the effect, but um, that is counteracted. So these patients were all um, so. uh, uh, still um, uh, asleep. So I yes, blood just pressure. Want, uh, to mention that we are still now fighting to get this access to the myurinol, but maybe Professor yeah. Henkes will mm -hmm. tell us, is there a big difference if we start we, to use it? Yeah, we developed kind of an escalating scheme, starting with milrinone uh, as a first yes, attempt. So, no. so we give uh, 8 milligrams for 30 minutes uh, on a daily basis, and uh, if the patient continues to have even more vasospasm, we change, as Iris said, so a continuous infusion of nemodipine, the, the short-term infusion of nemodipine doesn't work. You have to give it over days. Mm -hmm. But it's always a trouble with the, the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's important to, to know it. It's a very important topic, in my opinion, because the patient with soprenate hemorrhage, the procedure could be perfect, clipping or coiling. Exactly. And they cannot be not survival after 10 days. Mm -hmm. So it's and very important to And there to are a lot of things we can process. implement in our practice. Yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you once again, Dr. Tanova. The next speaker.